In round one, more than 80,000 turned up at the MCG, and this time they couldn't believe their eyes. Jill Brownlow medalist and the Blues best player that day, Greg Williams, gave field umpire Andrew Coates a shove. He was reported and suspended for nine matches. Carlton would win a court appeal and Williams continued playing. The sorry saga would drag on through the season as the AFL contested the decision. Court cases, huge legal costs and finally a reversal saw the champion Blue sit out his penalty. At season's end, he would retire. It was obviously difficult. Uh, you know, Carlton backed me because I thought they thought and I thought I was in the right and um, I think the, the chairman of the tribunal made a huge decision, uh, wrong decision and um, you know that's the way it goes. Perhaps to help defray the huge costs, Carlton traded in their famous dark blue Guernsey for one week and appeared in a lighter blue version to promote a new confectionery against Adelaide in round three. Anthony Kudafidis would be at loggerheads with the club over his continued involvement with footwear company Adidas. And on the footy front, Stephen Kernahan would play his 250th game and eclipse Dick Reynolds' league captaincy record of 224 games. And in round seven, overtake Harry Valance as the club's greatest goal kicker. It was some season, and Carlton was always in the thick of it. Port Adelaide would become the 16th team in the AFL and receive a fiery baptism. Under coach John Cale, they would watch Collingwood kick 11 goals straight and beat them by 79 points. For the first time in 40 years, both the previous year's grand finalists would open with a loss. North's defeat by lowly Melbourne, all the more painful, with serious injury suffered by skipper Carey and gun ruckman McKernan. And while a record crowd of 329,000 saw the season open, Adelaide's new coach Malcolm Blight started off with a win against Brisbane. He would play a major part in the months ahead. A week later, he watched in horror as his side was defeated by Richmond. Ruckman David Pittman coming in for the first Blight burst of the season. To start like that means you won't win, particularly with a pathetic effort from Pittman in Ruck. I mean, it, it was the most disgraceful display I've ever seen from a big fella. That's pretty hard on an individual, but he's going to have to live with that because we got carried away as a team. Port Adelaide registered its first win in the AFL in round three. The exciting Donald Dickey starring against Geelong. Dickey plays on and thank you. A week later, 47,000 packed football park for the first showdown between the twin prides of South Australia, the Crows and the Power. Cale's men outstanding. Collingwood beat Essendon in front of 83,000 in the traditional Anzac Day clash, but a cloud would hang over the game as Michael Pryor fought successfully to clear himself of racial taunts to magpie Robbie Armat. Melbourne Football Club was in turmoil. On the bottom of the ladder, with coach Neil Baum under constant pressure, the Demons were under the leadership of mining magnate Joe Goodnick. At the end of April, he replaced general manager and former captain Hassa Mann with former Tiger executive Cameron Schwab. There were only 18,000 at Optus Oval, but they saw history as the Bulldogs beat Hawthorne. Jason Dunstall became the second man after Gordon Coventry to kick 1,200 goals. 1,200 goal coming up after the siren, three-quarter time to level the scores. Dunstall, 1,200 goals. Only the second man to reach 1,200. And in a flash, Chris Grant's Brownlow dreams evaporated. For the first time in his 168-game career, Grant was asked to appear before the tribunal. An incident which had been overlooked by the umpires aroused the interest of AFL chief Ian Collins. Grant would be suspended for one match for striking Hawthorne's Nick Holland. It would have devastating consequences. A week later, Dunstall would see his season come to an end. He would require a second reconstruction of his left knee. For Essendon's Michael Long, the same sorry story. He would need a third operation on his right knee. He would also call for mediation with St Kilda's Peter Everett after the big saint racially taunted him. At Subiaco, Fremantle moved into fifth spot on the ladder as Quentin Leach achieved hero status with a match winner after the siren against Brisbane. If he misses everything, Brisbane Lions have won. He kicks... 
Hoganas River and Subiaco, and they come from everywhere. Melbourne had lost eight straight games. After kicking only three goals against Port Adelaide, Gutnick reacted by sacking coach Neil Baum. Into his place came reserve grade coach Greg Hutchison, and a few days later the Demons would upset Richmond to end the drought. A big win for the Melbourne Football Club. Richmond was wallowing in 15th place on the ladder, and after a 137 point hiding by Adelaide, followed Melbourne's ruthless example and sacked the coach. Out went Robert Walls and in came Jeff Geeshan, his trusty assistant. One week later, the Tigers celebrated with a victory over the Bulldogs. This time, steady again, and the Tigers are on the board again. Another major, they're 15, and that could have wrapped it up for the Tigers. The Victorian government announced that the Balderstone Hornybrook Consortium, which included the Seven Network and News Limited, had won the $435 million tender to build the new Dockland Stadium. The first games would be played in the year 2000. St Kilda would finish on top of the ladder despite losing seven games. Adelaide under Blight finished fourth, with full forward Tony Modra winning the Coleman medal. His 81 goals, the lowest to win the award. There would be more controversy leading up to the finals, as the AFL announced Richmond's young ruck star, Justin Charles, had tested positive for the anabolic steroid Boldenone. He was suspended for 16 matches. The death of Princess Diana caused the AFL to reshuffle its qualifying finals fixtures. The Bulldogs eliminated Sydney, but the match between Adelaide and the West Coast was moved from Saturday night to avoid a television conflict with the Royal Funeral. St Kilda eliminated Brisbane thanks to the performance of its stars, Lowe, Jones and Harvey. Adelaide had no trouble defeating the Eagles, and in the surprise of week one, North Ender Geelong's hopes of an easy run. Carey at his very best with seven goals. The right now is the difference between the two teams. The Eagles put up a brave show in the first semi, despite being ravaged by illness and injury. Glenn Jakovic doing a great job on Carey, but lacking support. Geelong travelled to Adelaide. They watched in dismay as Sean Wren showed his recovery from two knee reconstructions with a best on ground display. And in horror, as Lee Colbert's mark was not allowed. Down towards full forward. Oh, oh courageous man. Mark Colbert with the flight of the footy. Oh. And up by Vernon, this isn't going to pay it. Well, that's worse than any other mark that hasn't been paid tonight. Well, gee, Bond got paid a doubt for one in the uh, second quarter, and this is a screamer, Jared, isn't it? It's a great well, mark. There's a, there is a saying, catches win matches oh, in cricket. Oh, gee. And that mark was one of the best marks we've seen uh, for the season. It was so courageous. A week later, the Crows looked anything but a premiership threat in the first preliminary final against the Bulldogs. Tony Modra injured his knee and ended his season. They kicked erratically and trailed by 22 points at the last change. Then it started to happen. Chance for Smart, a fumble. He's got it. Smart kicks a goal. Under two minutes left. Darren Jarman. The spotlight is on him. 35 metres out. The Crows are in front. North's chances of defending its premiership crashed with Corey McKernan at the 11-minute mark of the first quarter of the preliminary final. That's hurt him too, Sandy. Oh, that's His right shoulder. 77,000 saw St Kilda, with Heatley kicking seven, through to their first grand final since 1971. The Saints celebrations continued into grand final week. Robert Harvey winning the Brownlow medal after a stellar season. For the first time, though, the winner had not polled the most votes. That honour had gone to Chris Grant. I'd have to say commiserations to Chris Grant. It's, in a way, a hollow victory, I suppose, because um, I, I think... No, I think um, Chris, uh, nobody, oh, nobody could be a bigger one. I think um, certainly Chris Grant, um, I believe, is one of the best players in the AFL. So um, to have to have that happen to him, I think, um, is really bad luck. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously disappointed. I'd be, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't disappointed with the whole thing. But I think probably from my point of view, I'd probably dealt with most of it for the whole year, and you know, knowing that I was sort of suspended you know, during the year, and it was early in the season as, as well, you know, being round seven, so. You know, coming into the year, um, you know, of course you don't know what's going to happen with Brownlows as well, of how the umpire is going to be a year, but I suppose the, the big thing for me was just the fact that you know, I was 
able to sort of um, go away and so I was holding my 